Abbott and Costello Meet the Podcast podcast. I'm Nick Anna Maria, co-author of the new book, The Annotated Abbott and Costello, written with my good pal, Matthew Conium. Uh, he would be here normally, but uh, see, since, he lives in, since he lives in England, not only is his clock five hours ahead of ours, uh, but he's a busy guy. He's He's got the Marx Brother Council uh, page on Facebook. If you haven't seen it and you love the Marx Brothers, you should really look for that. And he's got the monthly Marx Brothers Council podcast, uh, which I've appeared on, I think, four times. I think it's four or five times. I forget. Uh, so he's a busy guy and he writes a lot of books. There's a joke going around England that uh, things are slow in England right now. Matthew Conium hasn't written a book all day. So um, <laughs> I think he's come out with two while we were writing the Abbott and Costello book. And now since it's been released, I think there were two more books. So he's a very prolific writer and one of my favorite writers, actually. I want to introduce my good friend and producer, Jerry Shario. I had to Hello ask there. Him, Hi there. I had to ask him Hi. how to pronounce his name. Here's how he spells it. S-C-I-A-R-R-I-O. Now I That's said right. Schiario, and he went eh, and uh, told me it was Shario, which yep. is, would be a great. Actually, if if you use that one name, you could be a uh, like a romance novel model. There um, you go. You know, when <laughs> when I started getting involved in performing in theater when I was a mm-hmm. young boy, my dad told me, "You do whatever you want to do. All I ask is that you don't change your name." You know, my dad gave me the same speech. Because mm-hmm. when I started, uh, I was, and listen to us, we're talking about our, our own careers rather than blood <laughs> and blue. <laughs> but who cares? It's ours. It's our podcast. Uh, when I first started, I was 15 years old and I started uh, in an act. Uh, there were three of us and uh, we did like a Ritz Brothers, Marx Brothers crazy Ooh. stooge thing. And um, I changed my name <laughs> three times, actually. <laughs> and I ended up with Harry Jackson. <laughs> And I okay. just thought, I just thought it was easy to pronounce and it was very, you know, normal. It was not ethnic, you know, so nobody could judge you. It was Harry Jackson. I Harry for Harry Ritz, of course. Yes. Uh, Jackson, I think I just pointed to a name in the phone book. And now let me explain what a phone book is. <laughs> now, if you're listening to a podcast about Abbott and Costello, you know what a phone book is. More than um, likely. Alexander, four, 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 four. So uh, anyway, yeah, so I changed my name. And my dad, it hurt my dad's feelings. And he said, you know, mm-hmm. are you ashamed of your name? And I said, no, no, it's just too long. Now, I think it's just one of the most beautiful names I've ever heard. Uh, Santa Maria. Yeah. You think about it. It's Santa Maria. That's St. Mary, the mother mm-hmm. of Jesus. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, that's no small, you know, thing. Anyway, so we're talking about Abbott and Costello. Now, there's a very, very, very big reason that Matthew Conium and I wrote that book. And we talk about it in the book. We don't understand why Abbott and Costello have been relegated to second-class citizenship in classic comedy, in the realm of classic comedy. If you mention in a, a room full of uh, what I call semi-pompous film historians, and you bring up your love of Abbott and Costello, they sort of look down on you, especially if they're standing on the chairs. But um, <laughs> Chario, that, that's your name, Chario. Um, there you go, yeah. <laughs> that's the French pronunciation for Chario. <laughs> uh, pardon me for swinging low. But um, anyway. <laughs> All right, get used to this, okay? <sighs> Just the way it works. And, um, and here I thought we were going to have trouble filling an hour. My goodness. <laughs> this is sort of a filling station. So here yeah. we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so here we are uh, talking about Abbott and Costello and why they have been uh, looked down upon for years, while the Three Stooges are probably the most well-known and appreciated of all the vintage comedians. Mm. And I mean more than Chaplin, more than Keaton, more than the Marx Brothers, the Three Stooges. Now, to me, and a lot of people aren't going to like this, but that's too bad. Um, (laughs) To me, the Three Stooges, I, I kind of place them with cartoons. Okay, that's, you know, we watched them after school. Popeye was on first, then the Three Stooges, and then, you know, Mighty Mouse. So I kind of thought of them that way. And even their comedy, their comedy is very surface. It's very basic. uh, It's very blue collar. Not, Not bad things. None of those are bad things. But 
I just don't place them on that pedestal that people seem to place them on. I think that we have uh, suffered from a, and don't take this the wrong way, folks, a dumbing down of our culture. If the Three Stooges are the most uh, revered of the great vintage classic comedians, there's something wrong. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) And you know what? I'm also going to put this out there. And I know that there are certain people out there that aren't going to like this either. But you know what? I really don't care. Bud Abbott. A lot of people, and there is a large group that feel that Bud Abbott is funnier than Lou Costello. And to me, Mm. that's, that's, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Uh, Now, I find Bud funny. In his way, yeah. you know, his his opportunistic character can be very extreme. Uh, mm-hmm. The slapping and stuff is very extreme. But to place him next to who I consider to be one of the great comic artists of the 20th century. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> he was he was the best straight man in the business. And Indeed. you know what? That's enough. That's mm-hmm. enough. I was watching uh, the second season of their uh, sitcom, their, the Abbott and Costello show, which was recently restored by uh, classic flicks. And they did a beautiful job. They're just a pleasure to watch. But, you know, occasionally they would throw Bud a funny line, a joke, mm-hmm. basically. And nine times out of 10, it's not funny. Mm. It's, it's a cutaway to him. He'll say the joke. He'll be a little hesitant about it. I can tell. I'm a performer. So are you, Jerry. Um, yeah. And, you know, he, he seems hesitant. He's, he doesn't go in with the confidence that Lou does because Lou is the comic. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I kind of don't understand that either. That's just, uh, hmm. uh, I don't know. What do you think about that, Jerry? I had never considered that even as an option. I do consider him to be a fine actor. Yes. Uh, some of his um, his solo moments, like in um, well, just pulling a couple of examples, Time of Their Lives or Little Giant even. He's wonderful in they're both. Not, yeah, they're not specifically playing a team in either of those films. Bit of a departure for them both. And right. uh, he's got some beautiful moments in oh, those. As um, the psychiatrist in, in Time yes. of Their Lives, he is yeah. very funny. You know, he is mm-hmm. very funny, but he's not he's not blue funny. You know what I mean? Well, and it's to, to me, it's that whole differentiation between comic and comedic. Lou Costello's a comic. He really mm-hmm. is. Yes. And and Abbott was capable of turning in a good comedic performance. Yes. You know what he was especially good at? Comic villainy. Mm-hmm. He was a great comic villain. And when you look at their team, their partnership, uh, I have a friend, Scott Ratner, who's a uh, playwright and and a performer. He's wonderful. But he's not a big Abbott and Costello fan. And I took him to see Who Done It, mm. arguably one of their best films. And we went to a movie theater, a packed movie theater to watch it. And oh, God, oh, you would have loved it. And the audience went crazy. They loved it. And as we were driving home, he asked me seriously, he said, I don't understand their relationship. Why does Bud place him in danger all the time? Mm. If they're friends, why does he put him in life, life altering situations, life altering? And, and, you know, he could die basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, And Bud pushes him towards it without, you know, any remorse or anything else. There is a routine where he does feel bad that he thinks Lou is dead. You know that routine. And then Lou comes back and they go right back to their previous relationship when he slaps him in the face. But (laughs) um, yeah, it's it's an interesting partnership. And the only thing I could tell him was that they had a burlesque partnership. And that's completely different from what Laurel and Hardy had who came up in film. You know, Bud and Lou came up in burlesque on stage. Whereas Stan and Ollie, we watched them uh, develop right in front of mm-hmm. us on film. But in burlesque, there are sketches, and you know, Abbott and Costello do them all, where it seems the straight man is from outer space. <laughs> he's, 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 well, here we are in Paris. Oh, la, 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 la. You know, they walk on stage and they start the thing, they start the routine. But they carried that over in burlesque. The straight man was very abusive. To the comic. Mm-hmm. In fact, Lou Costello became uh, a very, very popular comic right at the beginning, like 1929, 1930, as he was mm-hmm. on his way home from Hollywood. We're going to get to that. But he was he was so little 
and kind of innocent looking, you know, that he immediately mm-hmm. got sympathy. But the reason Bud Abbott was so popular in burlesque, everybody wanted Bud because he was he didn't care about sympathy. He just gave it to the comic and the hell with it, you know? Uh, <laughs> and you see that in the films later on. Yeah. He's, he's pretty much the villain a lot of times. Oh, these are my diamonds. Get away from me. These are mine. Oh, oh we got some money. Think about how well I can live. You know, all that stuff. Yes, uh, yes. I'm going out to find you a job. Did I ever tell you about my idea uh, for Bud after Lou passed away? No. Uh, it's an idea I had. Uh, the Bud Abbott Variety Hour. And he hosts the show. Uh, okay. And, like, and here he is now, everybody's favorite straight man, Bud Abbott. Yay! Hey, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. It's great to see you. I'd like to introduce my first guest. Here she is, the great lady of the American stage, Helen Hayes. And this old 80-year-old lady walks out and says, hello, Mr. Abbott. I'm quiet. What are you talking about? <laughs> on stage talking to Quiet, you. I just think... Everyone, every, every guest that comes on <laughs> is treated to the same treatment. <laughs> so, you know, today that would probably fly. It really would, yeah. Yeah, you know. <laughs> anyway, I just think that would have been, that's a missed opportunity, I believe. Yeah. He did those stupid cartoons instead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But anyway, I, I think, you know, for the uninitiated or the people who are giving Bud and Lou a chance, mm-hmm. I want to um, give a overview of their uh, career, their trajectory that led them to where we're going to be focusing on this podcast. I actually would like to go uh, movie to movie. And they made so many that I think it would behoove us to do it chronologically rather than jumping around, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, because they do sort of go through phases. You know, there's their first phase where they're super energetic and, you know, anything for a laugh. And then you see them trying some new things and then they slow down, you know, and you could see there's there's a little less interest, you know, in their performances, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, which you see in the second season of their TV show. I, I was marveling at the fact that they look really tired uh, especially Lou, and he underplays mm. everything. Yeah. A lot of it doesn't work because there's no music track to boost it up, you know, like the first season had. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, again, I'm, I'm jumping around. Uh, so Abbott and Costello, Bud Abbott was born on October 2nd, 1897, exactly seven years after Groucho Marx was born. So you had one of the greatest comedians ever and one of the greatest straight men ever born on the same day. There's somehow that seems right. Doesn't it, Jerry? <laughs> it does. Yes. I actually have always felt that way. <laughs> I think we're covered there. Yeah. Um, so Bud's born and he's born to a show business family. His father is an advance man for uh, Ringling Brothers Circus. His mother is a bareback rider, actually. Bud's father eventually became an advance man for the burlesque wheels. They called them wheels. They were circuits. Um, You would have a show and then it would travel from theater to theater, like vaudeville, only not as prestigious. It was a little seedy, the world world of burlesque. Um, And if you need to know about burlesque, I would recommend a movie called The Night They Raided Minsky's. Yes. It's... Oh, I just, I lose myself in that movie. It's mm-hmm. like you step mm-hmm. into that world. It's just wonderful. Yeah. Um, ooh, and you get a lot of sirens working there. In yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> the joys of downtown here. It'll, it, it'll be gone in a second. Anyway, so Bud, his parents yes. were in show business. And uh, just to, uh, there is a story. I don't know if it's apocryphal or not. There really is no proof of it other than Bud telling it. But apparently when he was a young, uh, late teen, uh, he was shanghaied and he spent a year on a Norwegian ship traveling around the world and then <laughs> came back after a year. That was the, wow. uh, that's the story. And, you know, he was shanghaied by the Norwegians. The, by the Norwegians, yeah. Okay, I I'd not heard that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some some Norwegian would. But oh, that was terrible. That was just terrible. <laughs> Wait, let me let me get the taste out of my mouth. Hold on, <laughs> oh, that's better. Okay, so uh, 
it, if that happened, fine. You know, it did sort of, uh, it sounds like a great adventure. It's almost a mm-hmm. Jack London type thing. So anyway, so Bud is uh, a young man. He, he's not a scholar. Uh, if you listen to his grammar when he speaks on the radio or in his, his movies, both Bud and Lou are the kings of the double negative. <laughs> they mm. they can constantly confuse doesn't and don't. That's just one example. But anyway, not a great scholar. Uh, loved hanging around uh, when they moved from, he was born in New, New Jersey, by the way. Some people say just over the border in Pennsylvania. But again, nobody knows for sure. Mm. Bud is a bit of a mystery. Anyway, so they moved to uh, New York and Bud loved to hang around Coney Island. And it's also said that he (laughs) had a very Bud Abbott habit of um, charging people a dime in the Hall of Mirrors and showing them the exit, but they would have to pay the dime. (laughs) Now, that that seems to make perfect sense, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. But anyway, uh, so Bud Bud is picking up his character as he grows up, and eventually uh, he gets into the burlesque business, but not on stage. He's a uh, he works at the box office. He's a manager of theaters. Um, His brother Harry also gets into the business, and he becomes a manager. And the dad, of course, is in the business. So Bud uh, eventually, just much like Oliver Hardy, uh, when he managed the. movie theater in Milledgeville, Georgia, when he was 18. Uh, and he would look on the screen and say, you know, I could do better than that. Um, <laughs> and sure enough, he did. Bud felt that way when he watched the burlesque routines being played out. And he, of course, he memorized every one uh, being a part of that world. Eventually, Bud became the most sought after straight man in the business. Again, like I said, he didn't care how uh, unsympathetic he looked. He was bullying. He was he was he was just a monster. And the more he would mistreat the comics, the more the audience loved the comics. And that's unselfish and thankless. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's why I love Bud Abbott. Bud Abbott was just he did the best job in the world and uh, gave everything, gave the spotlight to Lou. Uh, That was his job. And that was wonderful. So Bud's in burlesque, and he's doing very well. And meantime, in 1906, March uh, 6th, in fact, a little Italian uh, boy, Lou Costello, was born. Louis Francis Cristillo, Cristillo with an I. He was born to uh, Helen and Sebastian Costello, Cristillo, sorry. And he was a uh, rambunctious, very popular, very confident young man, not a great student, uh, much like his partner, had it from the beginning, as uh, people who grew up with him have said. Uh, in fact, he, his hero was Charlie Chaplin. And uh, it's said that he went to see the movie Shoulder Arms, which was 1919, I believe. Yeah. And uh, he saw it like 11 times and used to act it out for his friends. In fact, I think he won a Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest. Mm -hmm. He always wanted to be a movie star. That was his goal in life. But before that, he tried a few other things. He was a boxer by the name of Lou King and apparently did very well. He was a good boxer. And when I think about him boxing, it makes me think about his character, not his show business character. I mean, his life character. Mm -hmm. Do you know how confident you have to be to get in a ring and fight another man in front of people? Yeah. I I think about that. You have to be the most confident person in the world. And that's what Lou was. He was also the champion free throw basketball champion Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. New Jersey, I think for like three years running. Wow. Um, And it's hard to do while you're running. Um, (laughs) Politically. So, uh, no, but he was, uh, that takes an enormous amount of confidence to get that ball into that hoop over mm-hmm. and over and over again. And if you ever saw his um, This Is Your Life, Lou Costello episode, yeah. they actually hand him a basketball and they make him do it in front of, I, I guess it was like 8 million people at that point or something. <laughs> and God damn it, he did it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> he got it in. And, you know, that's, again, the confidence. Uh, and you see it in his performances. You see it in the energy he gives to every performance. So anyway, Lou decides after not becoming a full-time boxer or basketball player, um, he decides he's going to Hollywood. So he and his friend, Gene Coogan, hitchhike to Hollywood. And uh, what happens there? Lou gets a job at MGM. 
And you think, ooh, MGM, wow, that's incredible. Well, he was a carpenter and he moved scenery and he was a stunt man and an extra. And it's funny because he was so little. He was he was like 5'4". And uh, they used to dress him up as the ingenues of the silent movies. He was Joan Crawford at one point. <laughs> he was Norma <laughs> Shearer. You know, he was Dolores Costello. And they would dress him up and he would fall off the roof or he would do whatever. Yeah. In fact, there's a movie called The Trail of 98. I believe it was 1928. You see him, I, I spotted him, and it's very difficult to spot in these movies because the camera's always moving around. Silent movies are the best that way. Yeah, yeah. And you actually see Lou on crutches with a cast on his leg. And just before that, he had fallen off a roof, uh, dressed as whomever, <laughs> Mitzi Green. And, um, <laughs> and he really hurt himself. So you wow. see him with the cast, yeah. And the most famous appearance he made during that time as an extra was in Laurel and Hardy's short Battle of the Century. Yep. Uh, he's in the front row while Stan is boxing in the ring with Noah mm -hmm. Young. Uh, yeah, Lou is seen doing a lot of very Lou Costello-y type things. You know, <laughs> you see him do the whistle and, you yeah. know, he's, he's, he's talking to everybody around him. He's, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's very uh, prominent. In, yeah, he's in very easy, way. very easy to recognize in that film. Yeah. And, yeah. And he's thin. He's yes. still thin at this point. He was very athletic, actually. Um, okay, so here's what happens. He's very dissatisfied with the way things are going. Uh, he's obviously not uh, in a star position. It's said in Hollywood, even today, that when you accept extra work, it's the only way they'll look at you. So mm. you're, yeah, yeah. They're very myopic that way. They, they yeah. just see you as a, an extra. Uh, so Lou decided to head home and uh, try his luck on the East Coast. Uh, he was born in Patterson, New Jersey, by the way, which he mentions in every single film, <laughs> television show, radio. Goodbye, everybody in Patterson. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and that's where Lou Costello Park is and the statue of mm -hmm. Lou and all that stuff. He is their favorite son, even though the comedian Burt Wheeler was born there 11 oh. years before Lou. Yeah, Patterson, New Jersey. Didn't know that. In the Irish section. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, Lou uh, is hitchhiking home. And uh, he stops in St. Joseph, Missouri. And he notices that there is an ad uh, at a local burlesque theater. They need a Dutch comic. Now, I don't know if you know what a Dutch comic is, but it's basically a German accented comic. Mm -hmm. You think about it, Dutch is actually the wrong pronunciation of Deutsch. Mm -hmm. uh, so Lou went in with his German accent and this must be the place, all that stuff. And he got the job. And this was 1929. By 1930, he was getting amazing reviews. A comic to watch, a song and dance man. Mm. Uh, he, yeah, yeah. And we, we watched some of his musical abilities later on in Jack yeah. and the Beanstalk, right? Yeah. And, uh, and even when he sings White Christmas during the uh, Colgate uh, Christmas episode. Yes. He's, yes. he's quite good. He's Very. quite good. Yeah. And he does his dance, which I'm sure he learned in burlesque. You know, uh, so Lou becomes a burlesque comic and a one of the best comics in burlesque. Again, he was one of those comics that everybody wanted to work with. So how did they get together? Uh, this is again, I don't think either one of them ever told the story the same way twice, but um, <laughs> yeah. they had known each other, not closely, but they had crossed paths many times, much like Martin and Lewis did before they teamed up. They would play the same clubs and leave notes for each other and stuff. So Bud and Lou actually, you know, worked on the same bill together, but with different partners. Now, you know that, and I know from being a comedian, that, you know, you're, you've always got your eye on, on other people, that the really good people, you know, you keep your eye on them. And that's what Bud did with Lou and Lou did with Bud. They knew they were looking at the best there was. Mm -hmm. So eventually, I believe it was the wives. Now, this was uh, the beautiful Anne Costello, uh, who was a uh, dancer in uh, one of the shows. And uh, Betty Abbott was also a pony girl. That's the short girl on the end. Usually yeah. gets some comical business to do, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, they both married uh, burlesque Corines. I could say chlorine, but uh, that, would be, <laughs> <laughs> that would be dirty pool. Um, yeah. oh, oh, oh. Stop yeah. it. Just stop me. 
Just stop me. Uh, <laughs> I've been trying. Trust me. <laughs> Very trying. But, but you I'm know, bummed. it's these kids today with their long hair and Elvis dancing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Betty and Anne, yes. Yeah, yeah. They got together. They the uh, and I they kind of put the uh, the little bug in their ear, saying, "Why don't you guys team up?" And sure enough, eventually they did. I believe the year was 1936. And interestingly, um, not only did they uh, hit the ground running in burlesque and become the most popular team in burlesque, they teamed up with a guy by the name of Eddie Sherman. Now, Eddie Sherman is very, very important to their success. He later on becomes uh, discredited and is looked down upon, and but we'll get to that later mm -hmm. uh, in other episodes. But uh, he told them that you guys are too good for this. You guys are too good for burlesque, and I want I want to take you to other places. Bud was a little hesitant. Uh, he was very comfortable in burlesque. He was in it much longer than Lou was. Uh, had a niche for himself um, that took years to build. Mm -hmm. So I understand. Uh, but Lou was. Mr. Confidence and Mr. Ambition. He had to be a movie star. He would not be content unless he was. Uh, so Eddie Sherman took them out of burlesque, put them into presentation houses, meaning uh, movie theaters, which were huge palaces in those days. And they would play to like at the Roxy, they would play to five, 6,000 people. Mm. And this would be before the movie uh, started because vaudeville was pretty much dead uh, in 1931 when the Palace Theater in New York started showing movies. That's when it's considered uh, uh, dead in the water. But uh, they did still have presentation houses and they did still need acts to fill those uh, uh, places. So Abbott and Costello started doing a bunch of those. Uh, they also started working in high-class nightclubs as well, sometimes at the same time. Uh, they were very, very busy. Money started getting great. They started playing the Steel Pier regularly mm -hmm. uh, in Atlantic City. Um, and here's an interesting fact that not many people know. The Kate Smith Hour was a very popular radio show in the 1930s and into the 1940s. Um, she even went into television in the 50s. But anyway, uh, in 1938, their regular comedian on the Kate Smith Show was Henny Youngman, the king of the one-liners. And uh, he would get on, he would go and do his bit, you know, every week. And uh, eventually he got a bite from Hollywood. They wanted him to come and do a screen test and possibly play a role. So he had to go. Ted Post, the producer of the Kate Smith show, said, fine, you know, you're free to go, but please help us find a replacement. So with that in mind, he had gone to the theater. He might have been the Paramount. It might have been the Roxy, any one of those. And he saw Abbott and Costello, and I'm sure he'd seen them before, but it hit him. They would be great on radio. So he went back to Ted Post and he said, these are your guys. Ted Post got in touch with Eddie Sherman, their manager. And the next thing you know, they're on the Kate Smith hour. They wanted to start with who's on first, their, their main uh, sketch. But Ted Post, for some reason, just didn't think it would play on radio. <laughs> Can you imagine? Wow. So they started with a few other things. Now, there was a very important thing that happened on radio that uh, I find interesting, and you see it in some of the very earliest films. For some reason, the producer thought that Bud and Lou sounded too alike. Mm. Isn't that weird, Jerry? Yeah. Yeah, it is. I, I mean, I can understand the the attitude of the producer, but yeah, I would never say that those two voices are too close <laughs> together. No. Not at all. First of all, Bud had that smoker's voice, that yes. drinker's voice, you know, certainly Lou, you know, and, and Lou was like this. He was over here like that. Yeah. So, you know, but what he made them do, ugh, and I can't even listen to this, whatever's available from these days, mm -hmm. they made Lou talk in a very high register, like a child almost. Yeah. And it gets really old after a while, although the, the public ate it up. Uh, but he's up here. Oh, I'm a, dog, I'm a bad boy. <laughs> all that, all the stuff I don't like about Luke Costello right. happened during those radio shows. Now, uh, one thing I've noticed you know, when you watch film of them mm -hmm. on radio, which you know, there's not a lot, but what you do see yeah. it as a, a performer, as a radio person myself, 
I love watching how Bud is like right on top of the microphone. And mm -hmm. Lou is usually back about a step, which right. gives him much more flexibility in his range and his volume. He can do all kinds of things with his voice. But Bud is just Absolutely. right on top of the mic. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and Lou basically did project a bit more yeah. than Bud. So it was good that he, he stood back. Yeah. And come to think of it, uh, there's that wonderful footage uh, from Command Performance. I think yes. Earth the Moore introduces them. And they do who's on first. Yes. That's one of my favorites. That's one where Lou drops the D word. And yeah, I don't it's, give a damn. Right? Yeah. And you know, you, you you heard the stories. You know that that's what it was in burlesque when they did it live. That's but right. That's the only record we have today of the, <laughs> the full. Because we've got, you know, the give a darn. I don't care. Mm -hmm. They don't really yeah. carry the same power. No, they don't. They really don't. It still works. You know, it still it does. works. It's it a great does. punch line. It's a great yeah. punch line. I think I, a friend of mine came up with this. I think I took credit for it several times, but still a different ending to Gone with the Wind. And it's just, you know, it, it's, she's frantic. Uh, Red is leaving. And it's like, oh, Red, Red, if you should go away, what am I to do? Where am I to go? And he looks and says, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Oh, that's our shortstop. And he, he slaps her and walks away. <laughs> I just think that's brilliant. That that would have been a direction. Yeah. It <laughs> oh, God. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a bad pun, too. Terrible. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. When yeah. you have to explain them. Um, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so Bud and Lou are yes. working for Kate Smith in 1938. They're playing every live venue they can. And in 1939, believe it or not, producers Olson and Johnson, wow. right? Only Olson yeah. and Johnson, a comedy team long before Abbott and Costello had got together, were riding the crest of a success with the most successful musical comedy on Broadway until Fiddler on the Roof. And we're talking about Hell's a Poppin'. I uh, did not know that. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I know Hell's a Poppin', but I didn't realize it had been that successful. Wow. It was so popular. Yeah. And uh, if you ever read, and I recommend it highly to anyone who loves comedy, Hal Cantor's autobiography. Um, mm. I can't remember the title of it, but Hal Cantor wrote it. And he talks about uh, being a young writer and going backstage at Hell's a Poppin' and selling Oli, who was the businessman of the of mm -hmm. the team, selling him jokes. And he remarked uh, how cheap he was, uh, Oli. Uh, <laughs> he would buy he would buy the jokes, or he would take the jokes and say, you know what, uh, whatever. He would he would save them and use them for the next show. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So he would get mm -hmm. the most value out of all of these jokes. So Olson and Johnson, uh, with their Broadway power, produced a show called The Streets of Paris. And it starred another member of a comedy team. This is very interesting. A comedy team hired Bobby Clark, formerly of Clark and McCullough. Uh, unfortunately, his partner, uh, about three years before, committed suicide mm. in a terrible way. But anyway, Bobby Clark was still a huge comedy star on Broadway, and uh, Carmen Miranda made her American debut in that show, and Abbott and Costello in their only Broadway appearance. Mm -hmm. Now, their reviews were incredible. The, the critics just fell all over themselves. And you think, did any of these critics ever go to a burlesque show? Because uh, <laughs> everything they did in, in the show, other than a couple of things they did with Bobby Clark... They were doing burlesque sketches. They were doing the yeah. drill routine, the army routine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Throw your chest out. I'm not done with it yet. Um, <laughs> they were doing uh, the lemon table bit, you know, all of that. So they they really uh, kind of ran away with the show. There's a famous story where uh, there's a scene where um, Bobby Clark is wearing a beret and uh, he's carrying a cane, of course. And Abbott and Costello are on stage with him and they're doing this bit. And uh, Bobby Clark drops his beret. He dropped it, and Abbott and Costello started playing with it like it's a hockey puck. 
And the audience just went nuts. And Bobby Clark just kind of stood there uh, until th the following night when they did it again, he was ready. Uh, he, he, I think he had some gear or something, or, or he, he, he took out a whistle like a referee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't mess with Bobby Clark. <laughs> no. So um, then the show was picked up by Mike Todd, the famous producer, mm -hmm. and he brought it to the uh, 1939 World's Fair in New York. And uh, it was another, it was a huge hit there as well. And instead of Carmen Miranda, you had Gypsy Rose Lee. Wow. Uh, so even more of a burlesque show. So uh, this was very popular. They, they were doing just their trajectory was like, you know, the heading right for success. Every move they made was seemed to be the correct one. And you have to really credit Eddie Sherman for this. He saw nothing but superstardom for them. Anyway, so they wanted movies. Lou especially wanted movies. Yeah. So the time came, 1940 rolls around and they get three offers from movie studios. Fox Studios came up with a, an offer. MGM, where Lou was toiling as an extra and a carpenter, came up with an offer. And of course, Universal Studios came up with an offer. Now, here's why they went with Universal, which was sort of an A- minus studio compared mm -hmm. to Fox and MGM. They made a lot of serials. They made a lot of Westerns, a lot of low-budget uh, horror movies and things like that. But they had Deanna Durbin, who was, you know, she made a, a fortune for the studio. MGM only wanted them as guest stars. So that means that they would have been a specialty act. Let's say the movie Ziegfeld Girl, which is the one they were being looked at for. That was a, you know, a musical, I don't want to say comedy, it's more of a melodrama. But uh, you know that in the middle of the movie, the curtains would open and Abbott and Costello would come out. They'd do one of their routines and that would be it. Um, Fox pretty much offered them the same thing. Universal said, let's take a look at these guys. Let's put them in a movie uh, where they mm -hmm. actually play some roles and get to do their burlesque routines and see how it goes. Well, they made a movie called One Night in the Tropics in 1940. You're shaking your head. You oh, like yes. Looks like you've seen it. I've uh, seen it a few <laughs> times, yes. I've seen me too. I don't mind it. I think it's kind of fun. It's not a great musical. Um, no. Jerome Kern, who is considered the father of, of the modern musical and the hero to Gershwin and Irving Berlin and Cole Porter, you name mm -hmm. it, wrote one of the worst scores. <laughs> 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 and we're talking lyricists with Oscar Hammerstein, yep. uh, Dorothy Fields. I mean, these were A-list people doing B-list work. Yep. Uh, but Abbott and Costello came off smelling like a rose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alan Jones used to tell the story about his kids going to school and mentioning, oh, yeah, my dad's in One Night in the Tropics. And they're like, oh, really? Who, who's your dad? And she thought about it and she said, the little fat guy, you know, that uh, the, the funny guy. <laughs> yeah. So he made a real impression. But uh, yeah, they were singled out. They were they were the really the only thing that was singled out uh, in that movie were well, Abbott and Costello. Understandably. And you can imagine, oh, definitely. They were so on fire in that yeah. movie. They were young. That first shot of them at the roulette table mm -hmm. when they're in the Tuxedos. They yeah. actually played to a uh, henchman, to a uh, gangster, I guess, William yeah. Frawley. William Frawley, yeah. Fred Mertz. Yeah. And uh, they actually play very well with him. They, they have a good, and he comes back and Abbott and Costello meet the Invisible Man. That's right. One of the things I love about that, that moment actually in that film, you know, it is yeah. their introduction into films and they are known to the public as radio performers. And so mm -hmm. the shot is, Frawley is coming into the casino and you hear them. Uh -huh. Just a That's quick right. exchange that the two of them as he's coming in. So you hear them before you ever see them. That's that right. Very and that's smart. By design. That's uh, Eddie Sutherland, the uh, director. But I was going to say that uh, getting back to radio, uh, not only were they a huge hit on the Kate Smith hour, they also uh, got a regular spot on the Chase and Sanborn hour with Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Yeah. And then Fred Allen, of all people, talk about, you know, the gold standard of radio comedy. He hired them to be his summer replacement in 1940. So they were very, very uh, familiar 
voices to the audience, to the American audience. And when they did that in the movie, uh, you hear them before you see them. Lou is using the high radio voice. Okay, yes. I bet. Oh, I'm a bad boy. And once the camera's on them, they drop it. And you just want to say to the heavens, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yep. Because they become Abbott and Costello. And it's and it just goes from there. So, uh, yeah, their first movie was a, a bit of a stinker uh, as far as critically. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> Jerome Kern. Oh, gosh. <laughs> anyway, I love that. Well, Jerome Kern uh, supposedly was very, very against Abbott and Costello being in the movie. He felt oh. they were too low you know, to be oh. in the movie. And I just love the fact that they got all the reviews and Jerome Kern <laughs> was sort of <laughs> thrown out of the woodpile. Uh, <laughs> see, but um, they, were, they were just incredible. There's a sketch in One Night in the Tropics that they never did in another film. And it's called 365 Days. Yes. Right. That's my one favorite of my favorite bit from that movie. They only did it that once. Yeah. Now, and you know, Abbott and Costello repeated routines. And I make this point in the book that, uh, yes, they repeated routines a lot, but that's because the audience wanted them. Yes. If you went to a Sinatra concert and he didn't sing your favorite songs, you'd walk away disappointed, yep. even though you've heard them a thousand times. It's the same with Abbott and Costello. They had their, their string of hits and uh, the audience demanded them. So 365 days. Lou, it's, it's a typical contrived burlesque routine mm-hmm. where Lou is actually working for $1 a day for 365 days. And he's owed $365 when Bud fires him. Well, it turns out that Bud starts deducting days, holidays, Sundays, half days on Saturday. <laughs> and eventually he's left with $1, which a waiter grabs and says, thank you very much, sir. Um <laughs> It's a brilliant routine. It really is. is. It really is. But I did find another version of it. Where? It's from the Ed Sullivan show. And it's it's one of the last things they, they did together. And they switched it. So, and this is a little uncomfortable, but Bud plays the tax man. And, <laughs> and Lou has to go in and collect his $365, you know, uh, uh, the yeah, refund. refund. The refund, yeah. yeah. So, and they work it that way. And of course, Lou's ad-libbing all over the place. And even Bud starts cracking up at some point. But it's on YouTube if you want to see it. Uh, Abbott and Costello, 365 days. Now, talking about great routines. Now, I'm going to stop here uh, as far as historically, because now we're going to pick up in the next episode, we're going to pick up their film career. And we're going to be talking about those and anything else that comes to mind, of course. Of course. But um, of course, (laughs) this is like a course, actually. But anyway, uh, this was voted, actually, as the greatest comedy routine of all time. I don't remember the source of that um, statement and and that uh, accomplishment, but I think it was a guy named Leo. Uh, I used to hang out at a bar I used to frequent when I was older. Um, But anyway, I have no idea. Um, But it is considered to be the grandfather of all great comedy routines. And Mm -hmm. I think you know what I'm talking about. And I wanted to use this on our first uh, podcast because uh, to me, it's just the best version of the best comedy routine ever. And we're talking who's on first. And it's from the film, The Naughty 90s, which was made in 1945 at Universal. And um, a lot of people, again, the same people, I guess, that think Bud Abbott was funnier than Lou Costello. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people prefer the uh, Actors Home episode uh, version uh, from their first season of the Abbott and Costello television show. Now, I got in a lot of trouble recently um, <laughs> by actually just one uh, reader. And this guy was like a troglodyte. His spelling was atrocious. His, he had no sense of grammar at all. But he was very offended that I preferred the Colgate Comedy Hour live shows to their uh, sitcom, their filmed sitcom. I still feel that way. Mm -hmm. I would still rather watch them in front of a live audience uh, rather than hearing that obnoxious laugh track. Oh, yeah. 
And that's what kills it. Uh, that version for me is we're listening to them doing who's on first with a laugh track, yeah. something you need, you know, not at all. So I prefer this uh, version. I think it's the best version they ever did. And if you listen very, very closely, you will hear the cameraman laughing. And I love that. <laughs> That's like when you're a comedian, when you're a stand-up comedian, you want to make the band laugh. You know yes. what I mean? You love it when the band laughs. Yes. Uh, and the cameraman, this is actually, they had to do it in a few takes because the cameraman would ruin the take. <laughs> and it is, it's hilarious. Their timing is so brilliant. It's so right on. Uh, this is definitely the gold standard. Uh, and I want you all to enjoy the magic of Abbott and Costello doing Who's on First. Will you keep quiet, Sebastian? Excuse me, please. Sebastian, please. Don't interrupt my act. Sebastian! Oh, Mr. Borges, I, I didn't see the lights now. I forgot about them. What in the world are you doing? But right. I, why interrupt my act like this? Well, look, Mr. Borges, I mean, after all, if you're in a ballpark, they always sell peanuts and popcorns and things like that. I know that, Sebastian, but not in front of them. I, I beg, I beg your pardon, friend. Ladies and gentlemen, and also the I, children, will you excuse me for a minute, please? Thank you. What do you want to do? Look, Mr. Borges. Right. What are you doing? I love baseball. Well, we all love baseball. When we get to St. Louis, will you tell me the guys' names on the team so I go to see them in that St. Louis ballpark? I'll be able to know those fellas. Well, now, is it all right, folks? All right. Excuse me. I'm, all right. I want to find out the fellas' names. As long as it's okay I'm, with the I'm audience. crazy about baseball. Uh, as as, uh, will you stand still? Pick up your hat. Go pick up your hat. Okay. Now, look. Then you'll go and peddle your popcorn and don't interrupt the act anymore? Yes, sir. All right. But you know, strange may seem they give ball players nowadays very peculiar names. Funny names? Nicknames, pet not, names. Not as funny as my name, Sebastian Dinwiddie. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Funnier than that? Oh, absolutely. Woo! Yes. Now, on the St. Louis team, we have uh, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellas on the St. Louis I'm, team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know's on third. Do you know the fellas' then, names? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean, the fellas' name on first base. Who? The fella playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? I'm not asking you. I'm telling you who is on first. I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who is on first? Have you got a first baseman on first? Certainly. Then who's playing first? Absolutely. When you pay off the first baseman every month, who gets the money? Every dollar of it. And why not? The man's entitled to it. Who is? Yes. So who gets it? Why shouldn't he? Sometimes his wife comes down and collects it. Who's wife? Yes. <laughs> After all, a man earns it. Who does? Absolutely. Well, all I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? Oh, no, no, no. What is on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? That's what I'm trying to find out. Well, don't change the players. I'm about. not changing nobody. Now, take it easy. What's the guy's name on first base? What's the guy's name on second base? I am not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. We're not talking about him. How did I get on third base? You mentioned his name. If I mention a third baseman's name, who did I say is playing third? No, who's playing first? Stay off of first, will you? Well, what do you want me to do? Now, what's the guy's name on third base? Well, what's on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. There I go, back on third again. Well, I can't change their names. Will you please stay on third base, Mr. Broadhurst? Please. Now, what is it you want to know? What is the fella's name on third base? What is the fella's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. Woo! You got an outfield? Oh, sure. St. Louis has got a oh, good outfield? Absolutely. The left fielder's name. Why? I don't know. I just thought I'd ask you. Well, I just thought I'd tell you. Then tell me who's playing left field. Who is playing first? Stay out of the infield! Well, don't mention their names out here. I want to know what's the fellow's name in left field. What is on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who is on first? I don't know. Third, Third base. base. Oh, take it easy. Take it easy, man. And the left fielder's name? Why? Because. Oh, he's center field. He's center. Will you pick up your hat, please? Pick up your hat and Whoa. stop this. Oh, look, Mr. Broadhurst. Yes. Wait a minute. You got a pitcher on a team? Wouldn't this be a fine team without a pitcher? I don't know. Tell me the pitcher's name. Tomorrow. You don't want to tell me the date? I'm telling you, man. Then go ahead. Tomorrow. What time? What time what? What time tomorrow are you going to tell me who's pitching? Now, listen. Who is not pitching? 
Who is on? I'll break your arm, you say. Who's on first? Why, come up here and ask. I want to know what's the pitcher's name. What's on second? I don't know. Third base. You got a catcher? Yes. The catcher's name. Today. Today. And tomorrow's pitching. Now you've got it. That's all. St. Louis has got a couple of days on the team. Well, I can't help that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> what, what do you want me to do? Got a catcher? Yes. I'm a good catcher, too, you know. I know that. I would like to play for the St. Louis team. Well, I might arrange that. I, I would know. like to catch. Now, I'm being a good catcher. Tomorrow's pitching on the team, and I'm catching. Yes. Tomorrow throws the ball, and the guy up bunts the ball. Yes. Now, when he bunts the ball, me being a good catcher, I want to throw the guy out at first base, so I pick up the ball and throw it to who? Now, that's the first thing you've said right. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Well, that's all you have to do. Is to throw it to first base. Yeah. Now, who's got it? Naturally. Who has it? Naturally. 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 Okay. Now you've got it. I pick up the ball and I throw it to naturally. I know you he, don't. You throw the ball to first base. Then who gets it? Naturally. Okay. All right. I throw the ball to naturally. You don't. You throw it to who? Naturally. Well, that's it. Say it that way. That's what I said. You did not. I said I throw the ball to naturally. You don't. You throw it to who? Naturally. Yes. So I throw the ball to first base and naturally gets no, it. No, you throw the ball to first base. Then who gets naturally. it? Naturally. That's what I'm saying. You're not saying that. Excuse me, folks. All right, I'm sorry, friend. I throw the ball to naturally. You throw it to who? Naturally. Naturally, we'll say it that way. That's what I'm saying. Don't get excited. Now, don't get I excited. I throw the ball to first base. Then who gets it? He better get it. All right, now, don't get excited. Take it easy. Hmm. <laughs> now, I throw the ball to first base. Whoever it is drops the ball so the guy runs to second. Mm -hmm. Who picks up the ball and throws it to what? What throws it? I don't know. I don't know. Throws it back to tomorrow. A triple play. Yeah, it could be. Another guy gets up and it's a long fly ball to be called. Why? I don't know. He's on third and I don't care. What was that? I said, I don't care. Oh, that's a shortstop. <laughs> Jerry. Yes, sir. What'd you think of that routine? It is probably the first time you've heard it, I imagine. Well, yeah, it came as a big surprise. I was not familiar with it at all. Um, my goodness, uh, when my son was nine years old, he and I performed that routine at his elementary school talent show. Oh, my God. Yes, really? at, at his oh, insistence, no. he said, you, We could do this. I said, Oh, yeah, great. You learn it, and I'll do it with you. And, son of a gun, the kid learned it. <laughs> He had the confidence of Lou Costello. Did he, do, did he do Lou's part? Of course he did. He wanted to get oh. the laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> I raised the boy right. What can I say? <laughs> you sure did. But oh, uh, yeah, cool. I actually agree with you wholeheartedly. This is, to me, the definitive, the best, the all-time greatest version. Because uh, they did it a few, uh, speaking of One Night in the Tropics, they did like a, what, a three-minute sure. version of it there yeah, even. Sure. and they kept cutting to the cab driver which completely threw it off for me yes yes but yeah this this is the the gold standard i think all right well that leads me to my next question and i this is a question they ask on the marx brother council podcast which i'm trying to uh um, pilfer from uh <laughs> openly but um when did you first encounter abbott and costello and oh, wow. what kind of a relationship was it well, I have always loved comedy in any shape and form. I remember my dad on his way home from work would stop at Woolworths or, oh you know, and I, I grew up in Boston. So there was another um, Zayers was a big discount type store like Woolworths. Um, mm -hmm. And they always had a dollar record bin, you know, LPs, vinyl records. And for those of you who, well, never mind. Um <laughs> I had to throw mine out. They all had holes in them. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> if if the record had anything to do with comedy, no matter how remotely, he would buy it and give it to me. And That's so wonderful. I got introduced to some of the greats early, you know, Shelley Berman and Mort Saul. Mm. So always enjoyed comedy. A mm -hmm. local TV station in the Boston area showed Abbott and Costello every Saturday night. And What time? Uh, it was early. I'm going to say like 7. Oh, okay. So, so kids could watch as well. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So I, <laughs> nobody could get me to do anything on a Saturday because I had to be in front of the TV because these guys were great. They were the best. Mm -hmm. And we're so alike. I, 
<laughs> unfortunately, <Scary>. yes. Uh, <laughs> but I think through that, I think I saw most, if not all, of their universal pictures. Mm -hmm. um, just on that. Right. And then managed to pick up the others as we went along. But I'm going to put that probably nine, ten years old on mm -hmm. average, so somewhere around there. Uh, right. The first time right. I found one of them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, I got halfway and, through and the film it. and it was like, oh, yeah, this is it. Yeah. They were my best friends mm. when I was growing up, you know, Bud and Lou. Yep. Uh, I'm from the New York area and um, they used to, well, I remember the first time I saw Lou. I, I still re I have that memory in my head. Uh, a neighbor, my best friend's mom, a Hanky Howard's mom, took us to see a revival of the movie West Side Story. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was making the rounds. I must have been six years old, basically. And uh, I remember coming home that night. It was a chilly winter night. And I came in uh, into the den and my brothers were watching the Abbott and Costello show, mm. which I had never seen before. And I heard that laughter, of course, but my eyes set on Lou and it was love at first sight. Yeah. I, and watching him made me realize what my future was going to be. I mm. always knew what I was going to be. Always. Yep. And that was from Lou Costello. I mean, Bud Abbott was important too, but at that age, Lou was the child, oh, yeah. Bud was the parent. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of connected with Lou. Um, but yeah, they became very important to me. And uh, for a while, uh, WOR Channel 9 in New York would show an Abbott and Costello movie at 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning, mm -hmm. and then another one, a different one, at 2 p.m. Oh. the same day. So I never went out on Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why I was fat, you know, yeah. <laughs> eating, you know, milk duds, watching uh, Abbott and Costello all day. Yeah. You watch the um, first one to have your lunch break and then you watch the second one. Makes perfect <laughs> sense. Yes. And then dinner. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah. And then Channel 11. And uh, most people will remember this. Uh, if you're from the East Coast, from the tri-state area, mm -hmm. Sunday mornings, 1130, uh, WPIX Channel 11. Abbott and Costello every Sunday morning. Mm. And unfortunately it was a 90 minute time slot. So a good chunk of the movies were always cut out. Mm -hmm. In fact, I didn't see the entire films until later in life when they started releasing them on video and DVD. Mm -hmm. uh, so now that we got to that point, I just want to mention before we uh, wrap things up about some of the new products uh, that have come out mm -hmm. recently um, celebrating our boys I want to pay special attention to Classic Flicks. Mm -hmm. It's a company that restores uh, films utilizing what is that called uh, when you're when you uh, fundraising, yeah, uh, crowd fundraising. Yes, crowdsourcing. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, tomato sourcing. And um, <laughs> I wonder why I have no friends. Don't, and, don't joke um, about something like that with an Italian. Come on. <laughs> I believe me, I know. I'm having, I'm having lentils over rice today with the tomato sauce. It's going to be so good. Ooh. But anyway, um, <laughs> so um, Abbott and Costello recently on Classic Flicks, they restored uh, both seasons of the Abbott and Costello TV show, which I do like, by the way, for the record. I like the show. <laughs> I just don't think it's as satisfying as seeing them in front of a live audience on the Colgate Comedy Hour. Agreed. That's just, yeah, right? We're of the theater. Yes. You know, you and I, Oh, so yes. We know the difference. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so obvious that, you know, it's a track. But anyway, they came out with both seasons. And interestingly, we're talking about the laugh tracks. There are some extras on these discs where they have episodes that don't include the laugh tracks. And they are so much better. Oh uh, my gosh. I'll be blunt here. I've got both seasons on DVD put out mm -hmm. a few years ago. And so when these right. uh, restored ones were coming out on Blu-ray, I thought, eh, well, you know, I've got them. They look good. This, however, may send me out to get them. I Let would love to hear it you. without the laugh track. Oh, and not just that, Jerry. They look good astonishingly good mm. they are just a pleasure to watch and to hear they the guys did an incredible good. job jack theakston and bob fermanek and and the gang there mm -hmm. they just did a, a, an exemplary job and really i would suggest you get them because it's not like watching the old versions you mm -hmm. know that had 
been released. I am actually, I think I'm in the credits for the version you have. Okay. Uh, because when the look. girls, when Chris and, and Patty Costello mm-hmm. were interviewed, I was hired to be the fact checker. Uh, so they would, they would want to say something and they turned to me, Nick, is this right? And I would say, yeah, this is right. So uh, I was there and that's when I, I was, uh, I'm, someday I'm going to tell the story of, of uh, how I met Chris Costello and uh, my wonderful lunch with Patty, uh, who is so down to earth and so sweet and really told me all about Lou as a dad. And he was just a typical Italian father. You wow. know, you're going out with who? When are you coming back? <laughs> I want to meet him. I want to meet this guy. He was that yeah. way, but that's kind of endearing. I like that. Yeah. So anyway, so they they restored the the uh, television show, and it is just incredible. It's just beautiful to watch. Even the second season, which is known mm-hmm. to be uh, the lesser of the two, yeah. it's it's different. It's, it is. It's, if Abbott and Costello made uh, two reelers during the, the that that period, mm-hmm. that's what they would have looked like, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Only with an obnoxious laugh track. Classic Flicks also restored, and you're not going to believe this if you don't have it, uh, and if you're a fan of Jack and the Beanstalk, which was a, f- a special favorite when I was a child, again, it's astonishing just yeah. to watch. I sent a copy to uh, Matthew Conium and his son, Edward, and just heard that they were, you know, it was jaw-dropping. It was just incredible. Mm-hmm. So they also did the same thing with Africa Screams, which is not my favorite Abbott and Costello movie, uh, but it looks great. It looks mm-hmm. just great. So they do wonderful work there. I want to mention my friend Rick Green, who not only supplied half of the photographs uh, for our book, so so generous he was, uh, he also supplied all of the posters and advertising stuff for the exhibit at the Hollywood Museum, the mm. Abbott and Costello Who's on First uh, exhibit. And our book is also proudly displayed under glass um, next to the pheasant. Very good. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jerry. <laughs> um, so the museum exhibit is still going on. A friend of mine was just there and sent me pictures. It looks great. There's costumes and all kinds of nice. scripts. Uh, and then Rick Green's new book, uh, Abbott and Costello, selling them to the American public during the wartime years. I know I have the title wrong, but still, it is enormous. And it is filled with not only uh, photographs that you've never seen and ads that you've never seen, but also he writes about stuff as well. Rick is a great guy and the book is f- for sale on Amazon. And uh, I want everyone, if, you, if you're if you interested in our book or in anything uh, Nick Santa Maria related, go to my website, nicksantamaria.com. You'll find ways to get the book. You'll see the stuff I've done in the past and uh, you'll see stuff that's inspired by Abbott and Costello because I'm part of Biffle and Schuster, which uh, is a uh, faux (laughs) uh, 1930s slash 40s comedy team, uh, Benny Biffle and Sam Schuster. That was with my late partner, Will Ryan. Mm. Uh, And there is a DVD out there called The Misadventures of Biffle and Schuster uh, that features a bunch of our short subjects. They're all in black and white, and we fooled many of people. They honestly thought these were old movies, and they're just done with so much love. Michael Schlesinger uh, definitely hit it out of the ballpark. I, this I would venture to say that Biffle and Schuster are the greatest 1930s comedy team of the 21st century, really. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I really like that. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though. I'm very proud of those films. That was uh, Rightly a so. lot of fun. And very, uh, oh, thank you, Jerry. That, and then very Abbott and Costello inspired. So those are just some things. Those are some things that are going around. And if you don't have the universal box set, whether it's the DVDs or the Blu-rays, uh, you are bereft and you really, <laughs> really should get it. It's just fantastic. <clears throat> I don't know what it is, but I watch Abbott and Costello movies more than any other classic comedians. And I guess I just feel comfortable there. Childhood friends. Right, Jer? Indeed. Indeed. So uh, I guess we can wrap this up. This has been number one, our very first podcast. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Jerry, did it seem uh, to go okay? I enjoyed it tremendously. But then, you know, I'm I'm a little biased. Now I'm worried. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Sometimes you ask questions and you don't want to hear the answer that's about to be 
uh, emit from your uh, outer labia. Um, <laughs> let's not have a labia dispute. Oh my um, gosh. Do we have to put a PG-13 rating on this show now? I don't know. <laughs> anyway. I don't, believe, I don't believe in censorship. Okay. So, Okay. Let's uh, just uh, say to everybody, thank you for listening. And we will be back in a month with uh, a look at One Night in the Tropics and other fun subjects we can hit upon. In the meantime, have a great month. And uh, on behalf of my buddy Jerry and myself, we'd like to wish you good health, happiness, and a good meal once in a while. I have no idea why I said that. <laughs> Maybe I'm hungry. I it guess could I'm be. hungry. It could be. Yeah, I think I'm hungry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Everybody take care. And uh, what was it Bud, Bud Abbott used to say at the end of their live performances? May you live as long as you want and never want as long as you live. That's right. I think that's a great way to end. It is. <laughs> it is. Bye, y'all.